Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Shannon Pierce. Welcome back to another episode of the Vibrant Health Show. Today's topic is Epstein Barr virus, which is probably one of the things most people don't understand, right? So I always say I kind of became this accidental expert on Epstein-Barr virus. I really wish I didn't know as much as I know now, but because this was my own personal root cause answer and the struggles I went through with chronic Epstein-Barr and all of the things I had to figure out on my own, because there is such a lack of answers out there, I now can help and teach you guys real true facts about Epstein-Barr virus because the information that's out there is terrible. Like if you Google Epstein-Barr virus, you are going to get one of two answers. You're either going to get, oh, it's no big deal. Everyone has it. Like there's nothing you can do about it. Or you're going to get doom and gloom. Like you'll never be healthy again. You're probably going to need blood transfusions. This is the worst thing in the world. And really neither of those is true, right? There's somewhere in the middle where yes, it's very serious. And we're going to talk about that today, but I fully believe you can be hundred percent healthy even if you have a chronic Epstein-Barr issue, because I myself have been there and have figured it out. So I'm going to go through today real facts with you guys, teach you the real deal. And I highly encourage you do not go down the Google rabbit hole of Epstein-Barr virus because it's a messy place to live. <laughs> we do not want to be there. So let's start with the basics. What is Epstein-Barr virus? I think even that's kind of confusing. So I'm going to open up my comments. If you guys have comments, questions, as we go, please ask, even if you're on the replay or watching on YouTube, I'll come back and answer those for you guys. So Epstein-Barr virus is the virus that causes mono, mononucleosis, in its acute form. So the first time you get it, the first time you're exposed to it, typically you end up with symptoms of mono. Now, for myself especially, and I hear this a lot, I had never actually been diagnosed with mono. I didn't know that I had ever had it. So in my mind, when I first started my health struggles, Epstein-Barr virus was not even on my radar because I didn't even know that I had had it early on because a lot of the symptoms of mono, sore throat, extreme fatigue, really go along with other infections like strep throat. And normally if you go in with those types of symptoms and they swab you and you're positive for strep or a different bacteria, they'll give you an antibiotic and they won't check Epstein-Barr virus because that's a blood drop, which is harder to do. So, so many people are just not tested for it and have no idea that it's there. And it does tend to co-infect with things like strep throat. So you get diagnosed with one, they never look for the other. You don't know you ever had it, but that doesn't mean you didn't. I have hundreds of women at this point that don't think that that's the issue. They've never had mono before and we test them. And sure enough, they are positive for Epstein-Barr virus. So just because you don't know if you've had mono in the past or not, does not mean that this is not your issue. And we'll talk more about that. So that was me. I had no idea I had ever been diagnosed with mono, started getting all of these crazy symptoms. And then when I did finally find out that it was a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, I started looking for answers. And there really aren't any great answers out there publicly that I could find. So I really had to take step by step and figure out my own journey. And from that is what I'm going to teach you guys today. So in the acute form, Epstein-Barr virus does cause mono. However, it is not the mono situation, the acute infection that causes the problems. It is the fact that this type of virus, and it's in the herpes virus family, so just like you can get reoccurring herpes infections and cold sores and how chickenpox stays in the body, the mechanism of Epstein-Barr virus is very similar, but in fact, it's actually more potent because of the areas of your body that it tends to affect your immune system. This is why Epstein-Barr is much more known for its chronic effects than a lot of other viruses because it attacks specific areas of your immune system. So Epstein-Barr virus in its chronic form is what really makes the most problems for people. Now, the difference is you'll hear doctors say, well, everyone has Epstein-Barr. If you test it, almost everyone, like 99% of the population has Epstein-Barr titers positive in the bloodstream. That is true. Most of us have been exposed to Epstein-Barr at some point in our life. The difference becomes somebody, so I always use the example of me and my husband. 
my husband didn't really have chronic health issues growing up. He has a great immune system. He didn't have a lot of problems. So he could get exposed to Epstein-Barr once, his body fights it off, great, he gets sick for a minute, gets over it, it goes dormant and it never reactivates again. He has titers in his bloodstream because he's had it in the past, but it never reactivates. So he doesn't get a chronic issue, right? And then you have someone like me or a lot of the women that I work with who I had massive inflammation. I had hormone imbalance. I had a lot of stress. I wasn't good at managing my stress. I had other infections in my body like H. pylori. So you take a virus that reactivates in the presence of stress, hormone fluctuations, other infections. I had all of them. That means my body just kept continually reactivating the virus. And that's what causes the chronic Epstein-Barr. So the question of, does everyone have Epstein-Barr? Most people have titers for it. Does everybody have a chronic Epstein-Barr infection? No, not everybody has that same situation. It really depends on the health of the host. Okay, I'm going to say that often. However healthy the person is, which means however many layers of stuff that they have to deal with will make it more likely that you will become somebody who gets really you know, sick and feels the symptoms of a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. So if you know that's you and you're like, yeah, I know I have, you know, gut problems or I have skin issues, I have all these other things, you are more likely the person that Epstein-Barr will create those chronic issues with. So I always get the questions too, when somebody finds their tests are positive, hey, do I have to test everyone in my family? You can, right? It's good to know, but again, it all comes down to the health of the host. It's not going to be the same for every single person. So yes, most people have been exposed, but no, not everyone gets the chronic EBV. The CEBV is what we're talking about today when this becomes problematic long-term and has been linked to lots of different health issues. So hopefully that alone answers a few questions for you guys, because you've probably heard that before. Everyone has it. It's no big deal. It's a big deal if your body can't fight it off. And that's where we get into this chronic situation that we're going to talk about today. So let's start with some red flags. These are things that if I'm talking to somebody on initial consultation or they're messaging me on social media, I'm asking these types of questions. And if you have more, I typically say if more than three of these sound familiar to you, I highly suggest you start investigating Epstein-Barr as part of your root cause. First one is unexplained anxiety. So anxiety when really you shouldn't be that anxious, right? Something little happens and you react way stronger or you've ever had the experience where you go to lay down at night and nothing's wrong. Like there's nothing you can pinpoint that's abnormal, but yet you still feel this kind of sense of dread and anxiousness. That is one of the things that goes along with a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. So that's one. Number two is if your symptoms go in cycles. So if you can pinpoint, and this was me almost my whole life, I believe, I'm kind of looking back for myself, I believe I was likely first exposed to Epstein-Barr when I was eight years old, because that's when a lot of my health issues started. And from that point on, I can like pinpoint, hey, I had six months where I felt great. And then I would be down, like missing weeks of school for no reason that they could never find out why. And then I would have a few months of, I felt great, nothing was wrong. And then without anything really changing, I would have another couple of weeks where I was just wiped. Sometimes it would last months as it got worse and I didn't deal with it. It started lasting years, but I can very clearly see cycles in and out. That's really typical when we're talking about a viral reactivation because there's times it's dormant and you feel good or better at least. And then when it reactivates, you get much more magnified symptoms. So if you feel like how good you feel, your general well-being, your symptoms go in cycles like that, typically for me, that's a red flag that we're dealing with some type of virus, Epstein-Barr being the most likely cause of that. Fatigue. So the kind of you know gold standard for mono is fatigue, right? Super tired all the time. Well, that happens in chronic Epstein-Barr as well. But it's also that fatigue that feels like it's right down to your bones, right? We're not talking, oh, I'm tired. I'm getting through my day, but I'm not, you know, bounding with energy. I'm talking like, I feel like every cell of my body is tired. No matter how much I sleep, I'm exhausted. Everything feels so much harder to get through. Things that used to be easy to do feel really, really tough. 
that is so classic with a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. And if you'll notice, a lot of the symptoms that I'm going through sound similar to when I teach about adrenal fatigue, but typically they go hand in hand, right? Epstein-Barr wrecks the adrenal function. When your adrenals are weak, you reactivate Epstein-Barr. So it's normal that these symptoms kind of parallel the two. And likely if you have one, you probably have at least signs of the other. So that deep, deep, heavy fatigue that just doesn't go away, that's a big one. Skin issues, eczema, psoriasis, rashes that kind of move around. Those are all things that when we have that reactivated viral load, it does affect the epidermis, the cells of your skin, the epithelial lining, and it creates some of those skin issues. So especially if you're the person that you feel like nothing helps, like I could change my food. I could do the creams. I've been to the dermatologist and it's just still there. That was one of my big things, head to toe psoriasis and the reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus was one of the things that kept that going most of my life. Chronic pain, that was another big one for me. Joint pain for no reason. Waking up and my hands hurt so bad. I would get this pain in my neck that no amount of adjustments or massages would help. Feeling like my body was always sore. If I would get hit, just like a little bump, it would be painful. Like for somebody else, I wouldn't feel like that should hurt them as bad as it hurt my body. Um, or slowness to recover from things. Like maybe you get in a minor fender bender and you're with three other people. They're fine, but you feel like you got run over by a truck. Like having that really exaggerated pain response that doesn't feel normal. Epstein-Barr is the number one thing I find when someone has really severe chronic pain, especially when it's in their joints paired with that exhaustion. And we'll talk more about how that can actually become rheumatoid arthritis and different things in just a second. But yes, that chronic pain, that feeling like your body takes longer to recover than anyone else around you does. That's a big one. Um, and then some kind of weird ones like dizziness and ringing in the ears. That's one of the things Epstein-Barr has been really linked to. So I have lots of ladies who will message me and be like, that's the first time I've ever heard that. I've had this ringing in my ears for years and I can't figure it out. Or this dizziness that's so unexplained. Epstein-Barr is the mystery illness. Like any weird kind of crazy symptoms, I'm always thinking we probably need to check some Epstein-Barr to start, start working on some viral load. Um, and then lastly, and there's lots of other ones that can go along with it too, but these are the main ones that I look for is night sweats that aren't necessarily hormone related. So we're not necessarily menopausal, but feeling like you're getting that night sweat, waking up really clammy, that anxiousness in the middle of the night. That happens a lot when your body's trying to deal with a virus because your nervous system really works harder as you sleep and it can really turn on the night sweats, the clamminess, the hotness at night unrelated to menopause and those types of things. So that's my kind of go-to like rapid fire list of red flags. And if you have three or more of those and you haven't looked at Epstein-Barr as your potential root cause, what are you waiting for? <laughs> like there's, this could be the answer, right? And for me, it was absolutely the biggest turning point in my health journey is when I finally figured out that that's what was blocking all of my efforts. So especially that whole, you know, I feel like nothing works. Epstein-Barr is one of the things that will block that. So tell me in the comments, whether you're live or replay or on YouTube, have you ever been tested for Epstein-Barr? Is this new news for you? Are you hearing this for the first time? Or is this something you're aware of? Um, and you're just getting some more information. I'm really curious because I feel like a lot more people are learning about it, but it is still not talked about nearly enough because it does happen to more people than you would ever realize. So let me know in the comments, is this new news? Are you just getting extra information? And have you investigated Epstein-Barr as part of what's going on with your chronic health issues? Because it's a big deal, such a big deal that the medical community knows this, okay? Here's something I really want us to address. Sometimes you'll go to your doctor and you'll ask them about Epstein-Barr, your traditional, right, medical doctor, your GP, whoever, your immunologist even sometimes, and you'll ask them about Epstein-Barr. One, we cover that they'll sometimes just say, everyone has it, it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Or they'll say, yeah, we just don't test for that. Or they'll say, oh, well, even if it's positive, there's no cure for it, so there's nothing we can do. So I feel like a lot of people get stuck in this chronic Epstein-Barr situation because there isn't a great medical solution. That is why it's not tested. That is why it's not properly addressed because there isn't a medication. There isn't a vaccination. There isn't a one thing that they can give you. So let's say they do see that it's positive. 
great. They can pass on that information, but medically there isn't a quick fix. And even holistically, there isn't a quick fix. <laughs> There's a process I'm going to teach you today, but I, I really believe the reason this isn't talked about is because medically they don't have an answer. So why open up, right? Pandora's box of information if they don't have a solution for you. That's one of the bigger problems. But they know, the medical community knows this is a big deal. And how do we know that? Because if you search PubMed for Epstein-Barr and like chronic conditions, Epstein-Barr and autoimmune, peer-reviewed journal articles from medical journals, there are almost 800 different journals linking Epstein-Barr to a list, a litany of conditions. They know Epstein-Barr has been linked to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is actually, if you're here for thyroid information, Hashimoto's, the number one cause of Hashimoto's is Epstein-Barr virus. They find pieces of the viral DNA inside the thyroid of people who have Hashimoto's. It's been shown over and over and over again, yet it's almost never investigated when you find out that you have Hashimoto's. So if you have underactive thyroid, especially if it's the autoimmune version like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, you have to address Epstein-Barr because likely that's part of your root cause. They have linked Epstein-Barr virus to MS, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, certain types of cancers and lymphomas like Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are documented in medical journals that they know that this has a trigger and an effect on those really major autoimmune conditions and immune system issues that are rapidly rising, right? We have more autoimmune disease now than ever before. And I believe it's all the things we're talking about today not addressing this viral load issue, not properly balancing the body because our world is changing so fast that it can't keep up and we're developing these autoimmune issues. So I always say, if you have an autoimmune condition, there's likely a virus at the root of that. Probably Epstein-Barr, could also be herpes viruses or cytomegalovirus, parvovirus, there's other ones we check for, but the most likely is Epstein-Barr virus. So if you're listening to this and you have a diagnosed autoimmune issue, we need to really dive into the viral piece of this because it's well known that that is one of the main triggers and root causes of autoimmune disease. So hopefully that turns some light bulb moments on for you because a lot of times they'll tell you an autoimmune disease doesn't have a cause. It's your body fighting itself for no reason. It's just, you know, genetic or you're going to have it. That's not true. Something always triggers it. If it's genetic, why doesn't every single person in your family have it? right? Same with Epstein-Barr. It takes you triggering it, you turning it on. And Epstein-Barr virus is one of the things that does that more than any other virus that we know of. So hopefully that for you, if you've been struggling with autoimmune issues, there's a light bulb moment. Let's get to work on some Epstein-Barr stuff and it will make a tremendous difference. Now let's talk about, let me check comments really quick and reactivated to antibodies. Yes. For so long. Yes. And sometimes it can take for a while to deactivate it, right? You might've had this for decades when things built up. So she's mentioning that it's been a long road to recover from Epstein-Barr. And yeah, it will be because you probably had it for decades. If your antibodies are well into the hundreds, it's going to take some time to reduce those. You just have to stay the course. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today is there's pieces of the protocol. There's an intentional just one step after the other that you have to take because there is no quick fix. There really isn't for anybody. So this is the process that you follow and you continue to follow it until you get better. I mean, that's that truly is the only answer is just keep working step by step until your body gets healthy enough that you no longer reactivate the virus. That's, that's the key when it comes to Epstein-Barr. So number one starts with how do you test for Epstein-Barr? I get this question a lot. So Epstein-Barr is a blood draw. But it's important that you check all four titers because they mean different things. So I have different posts and I'll post a sample lab um, under here in the comments so you can see what those four look like, but making sure you're asking for all four and then you're having it interpreted by somebody who understands Epstein-Barr because having two of the four means one thing, having three of the four means something else. What three of yours are positive means something totally different. So it's incredibly important to make sure that somebody is looking at your labs 
who understands what the combination of titers means, whether it's a past infection, whether you're in a reactivated state, are you in an acute state? There's a lot of different information. So the four titers that we test, the first one is your IgM, and then we do your early VCA IgG antibodies. We do your standard IgG antibodies, and then you also want to do your nuclear antibodies. But I will post that down below in the comment section if you're asking your doctor to run labs for Epstein-Barr. Those will be the four titers that you want. And cannot stress enough, make sure the person reading it is really up to date on Epstein-Barr information, because a lot of times we'll look at it and say past infection and not give you any more information, when a lot of times that's just not the case. So we'll go through more of that in detail as well in another video, but you want to get tested for it. But regardless, if you have some of the symptoms that we went through, it's okay to start acting as if because there's nothing you're going to do to help, you know, support your immune system that would be detrimental, even if you didn't have specifically Epstein-Barr virus. So there is a hierarchy. There's an order that it takes to really get the body back on track. And that's what I'm going to walk you guys through today and really just teach in detail step one, because most of you, that's where you're at, right? Step one is the most important place to start for every single one of you which is always weaken the virus and strengthen the immune system, because that is relevant no matter what virus it is. If you know that you have recurring, you know, herpes infections, cold sores, if you've had shingles multiple times, or if you had any of those viral type symptoms we just talked about, or you know you have Epstein-Barr, step one is weaken the virus and strengthen the immune system. So I'll drop a link below. I actually created a 60 day protocol with herbs and supplements, with nutrition recommendations, with stress management audios, specifically to take you through step one. Now, some of you, most people who have come to me and they're like, yeah, I've been working on Epstein-Barr. They've only tried step one, right? So weaken the virus. There's some beautiful antiviral herbs. I really like things like monolaurin and lysine, medicinal mushrooms, um, beta glucans. I mean, there's a list of things you can use. The supplements that I use is a nice blend of my favorite antivirals. That way we're kind of hitting it from all different angles, as well as boosting the immune system function. So it's a blend of lots of different antivirals. And those are wonderful, but people will come to me and say, oh, well, I've been on antivirals for a year and I don't feel any better. Okay, great. So you've probably weakened the virus, but have you gone now and corrected the damage that having a chronic viral load has created in your body? So if you're that person, number one, if you've never even worked on weakening the virus and strengthening the immune system, the 60-day protocol is exactly for that. Let's weaken the virus, strengthen the immune function. Let's at least get step one taken care of. That is the best place for somebody to start if you've not yet addressed Epstein-Barr. If you've done that piece, now it's time to dig deeper into your physiology. And this is where it gets complicated because how my body adapted to Epstein-Barr isn't going to be the same thing for you. So I can't tell you, hey, support this hormone, do this thing for your adrenals, do this thing over here, because your pattern is going to look different than mine. So if you're frustrated and you've been trying a lot of things and it's not working, have you had individualized testing? Do you know how your body has adapted? Do you know if you have other co-infections which continue to reactivate the virus? Those are the next steps that you go through. So let me teach you in order of what becomes the most important when you're going through the process of recovering from chronic Epstein-Barr. So step one, weaken the virus or whatever's irritating your immune system, strengthen immune function. That's step one. Anyone who hasn't done that, you start there. Step two, I believe, is looking for co-infections and gut issues. If you have strep bacteria in your gut, if you have mold toxicity, if you have other like yeast overgrowth or parasites, those are going to be things that are not going to allow you to fully recover, even from the chronic Epstein-Barr. And really the only way if you know that you have those is by doing a comprehensive stool sample. So if you don't know if you have other co-infections, no wonder you don't feel like you're healing from your Epstein-Barr, right? There could be things that are consistently triggering it and reactivating it that are blocking you from getting the results that you look for. So following that same vein that immune system is the most important piece in recovery, you want to make sure you don't have any other co-infections or things that are triggering your body from being able to heal. That's step two. 
For most people that looks like a stool sample, checking for those other co-infections, that would be the next step. And then individualizing how you take care of that based on your labs, right? Stop guessing at things the whole way through. The more you can know your exact patterns and what your body needs, the faster this goes. But step two, co-infections and gut, 100%. Step three, and this is where everyone wants to start. We all feel like it's our adrenals and our hormones, and it probably is, but we will never balance your hormones if you have chronic Epstein-Barr, co-infections in the gut, and let's say mold toxicity. If you don't address those three things, I could give you the best things in the world for hormones and adrenals, and you still won't feel better because the first steps were more important than your hormones and your adrenals. I know that's shocking coming from me because all I talk about is hormones and adrenals, but to balance them, how we do that, health of the host, right? Remember I told you I'd say that a lot, the healthier you are, the less things standing in our way, blocking you from healing, the better results you're going to get. But make sure you dealt with step one and two first. And step three is, okay, because I've had these chronic infections, what's happened to my hormones, right? Have I stimulated too much hormone? Have I tanked my hormones? What do my adrenals look like? Am I in chronic fight or flight? Am I depleted and I'm in adrenal burnout? Those patterns are going to look different for every single one of you. I could test every person listening right now and your patterns will look different. You have to know what those patterns look like to make those best decisions. So again, whenever I hear someone say, well, I've tried all the things, have you, like, have you tested the right things? Do you know your patterns? Do you know that you're doing exactly what your body needs? Because if you're not, healing from chronic Epstein-Barr is going to be a very frustrating, very long process. And I believe when I Google things and I see people struggling for decades and doing all these crazy things, it's because they didn't know how their own personal physiology has changed because of a chronic virus. They're trying to do standard protocols across the board. And at some point, that's not going to be enough. At some point, you need good testing to know what your body needs to be able to make those right decisions. So unless you've done those tests, unless you followed all the steps we're about to continue to go through together, then you haven't properly dealt with a very serious chronic viral issue. So hormones and adrenals are a big piece of that puzzle, but you have to know what those patterns look like to make those good decisions. And then once those are balanced, then you go into detox and supporting your liver. Too many times do I talk to somebody and they're like, oh yeah, well, I started with detox. No, like you can't, your body's depleted. You probably have infections that you're circulating around by trying to detox too quickly. You can't detox the body that's in adrenal fatigue. There's so many things that you need to do first before you're ready for a detox. We never start there, never. A full detox and flush, it can take months for your body to be ready for that. But once you've weakened the virus, boost your immune function, identify co-infections, balance hormones and adrenals, we have your body stable. Now we go in and we pull the Epstein bar out of the cells. We pull it out of the thyroid. We pull it out of the liver. We get rid of what's still circulating. So it weakens even further. That's a very important step, but it has to be done in the right order, especially with Epstein bar. If you're someone who has done things for chronic Epstein bar before, you know, if you move too fast or you do something too soon, it will wipe you out. You have got to have an intentional plan for Epstein-Barr. That is the difference maker. That is how I recovered. That is how we've helped hundreds of women get through the same thing. It is a slow, steady, intentional plan that's individualized to you based on your labs. That is the answer. So once we get to that point, we can detox you. We detox, we pull it out. And then the final step, well, let's say almost the second to final step is then you rebuild and you replenish, right? A lot of people want to go right away to like, hey, I'm deficient in, you know, ferritin or it says I need more magnesium. And that stuff's great, but you're never going to build up a storage of your good vitamins and minerals if your body continues to use it up to fight a virus, to fight an infection, to support adrenal fatigue. So really we don't do a big just replenish or anything for your specific vitamin deficiencies until we've got rid of all the things that are blocked. And then you get to supplement with only the things you actually need 
when your body is balanced and healthy. So replenish comes right at the very end where now all the big fires are put out. We've dealt with the main things. Now you just give your body back that good stability. You give it back some energy so that it's strong and able, strengthen the health of the host so that it can continue to fight off Epstein-Barr and anything else that it is exposed to. That right there, my friends, is what it has taken me 10 years of my own healing to figure out that order, that specificity, making sure that you have an intentional plan step-by-step, that is the way you deal with a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. And then last step is know your triggers. So we know Epstein-Barr tends to reactivate in times of stress, physical and emotional, in times of hormone fluctuation, pregnancies, postpartum, perimenopause, after menopause, hysterectomies, anytime your hormones fluctuate, likely of Epstein-Barr reactivation or being exposed to any other infections. People are seeing all the time after COVID, it's reactivating chronic Epstein-Barr, any other viruses, any other strep throat, the flu, food poisoning. Those are all things that we know your body being exposed to another infection can reactivate Epstein-Barr. So once you know that, then if those situations happen, so for me, if I am having a really stressful season, I'll put myself back on step one. I'll go back on my 60-day anti-Epstein-Barr um, protocol to protect myself from not reactivating. Postpartum with all my babies, I do that. Anytime that I'm having you know, hormone fluctuations, I'll go back and redo step one to weaken the virus again, support my immune system so that I can really minimize or completely stop reactivations moving forward. And some people find that frustrating. They're like, well, I'm always gonna have reactivations. No, you're gonna get better at identifying them and supporting your body. But if you've had these chronic Epstein-Barr issues, you're always gonna to wanna to be aware of that. And you're always gonna to wanna to be one step ahead of it, making sure you're supporting your body in the seasons it needs it. So you don't end up in a big flare and a big Epstein-Barr reactivation. So you'll have those tools. And I feel like the tools are what empower you. You'll know what to do ongoing to prevent those reactivations but it really takes all of those steps. You have to weaken the virus and you have to boost your immune system and get you really healthy. Health of the host first, step one. Step two is gut and co-infections. Step three is adrenals and hormones. Once those are balanced, then we can detox and work on the liver. Once your cells are nice and clean, then we refill them with the good stuff that your body needs to stay healthy. And then you need to learn how to prevent or support from any continued reactivations. Literally, that is 10 years of my life in a neat little box presented to you on exactly what you do for chronic Epstein-Barr. And we see it over and over again, people getting their lives back and feeling better, myself included, when we follow those steps. But it's not quick. It's not overnight. It's not something I can guarantee you're gonna feel better in 30 days. And I know that's what so many people wanna hear, it will be a process. This will take you months, but in the grand scheme of things, let's say it takes six to nine months, committing yourself to six to nine months to get the rest of your life back. So worth it. So worth putting in that effort. So please, if you have questions, put them in the comments. I'll come back and answer them. Um, feel free to reach out to me on social media. Any questions you have about this, I'll drop any of the links that I referenced today down in the comments. And if you have not started anywhere with Epstein-Barr, 60-day protocol is step one. And then we can help you navigate the next steps as you go. My team offers free calls. If you want more information on where you think you should start, I'll drop a link to a free journey to wellness call that you get to get on with one of my doctors, ask questions. They'll navigate you in the direction of what your best next steps will be. If you're confused about where to start, that would be a beautiful place for you to begin, have that conversation, get some specific information, but start somewhere. I mean, it's going to be a process. You just have to start. So pick where you're at, start where you're at and don't get discouraged. It is worth the time and effort you put in to regain your health and the rest of your life. So thank you guys so much for joining. Lots of information about Epstein-Barr. I'll have other kind of deeper teachings on this because there's lots of things we didn't have time to cover today. That was a great first lesson. And I hope you took away lots of things that you can start with immediately to get your health and your life back. So join me next week for another live episode.